This is the story of United Airlines Flight 863. On the 28th of June, 1998, a United Airlines Boeing 747-400 was flying from San Francisco International Airport to Sydney International Airport with 307 people on board. Due to the long flight ahead of it, the 747 was very heavy. On that day, it would be the first officer who would be piloting the plane. A bit past 10.30 p.m. local time, the 747 lined up with runway 28 right. The night was a bit foggy, but visibility was good, and so the pilots saw no reason to cancel the takeoff. The pilots advanced the throttles and the 747 was going down the runway, just picking up speed. Soon, the first officer pulled back on the yoke, taking the jumbo jet into the sky. As Flight 863 entered a fog bank at the end of the runway, the pilots felt the plane rumble as a loud pump rocked the airplane. At first, they thought that a tire had exploded, but as they retracted the gear, the exhaust temperatures on engine number three started rising. They were having a compressor stall on engine number three. Now, that sucks, but it isn't a massive emergency. The captain got on the radio and said, United 863 Heavy, we've lost an engine. We'll be proceeding out the 295 and returning to the airport. As the seconds ticked by, the vibrations increased and the pilots worked on shutting engine number three down. As they did that, the vibrations went down and the exhaust temperatures on engine number three were down. The cockpit had four pilots and so the non-flying pilots handled the checklist and shut the engine down. The captain turned his attention back to the first officer who was flying the plane. And as he did that, the stick shakers came on. The stick shakers were an indication that the 747 was very close to a stall. In simple terms, if they did not do something, the 747 would just fall out of the sky. But they shouldn't be in this position in the first place. The 747 could very easily climb out with just three engines. This made no sense whatsoever. All the other pilots in the cockpit were asking the first officer to watch his speed as the 747 was dangerously slow. But now they had a new problem. The terrain warning came on. The jet was headed right for the San Bruno mountain, which rose to an elevation of 1300 feet. Somehow the 747 had drifted to the right of the prescribed path and was now headed right for a mountain. The jet was so low that it set off car alarms and sent people running for cover. Seeing that the ground was coming up fast, the first officer pulled back on the yoke in an attempt to climb. But this just put the plane in an even more precarious position. The captain immediately took over from the first officer. He had a tough job ahead of him. He needed to avert a stall. The best way to do that would be to drop the nose so that the plane could pick up some speed. But doing that would send the jet right into the mountain. In the tower, the plane was so low that the controllers could no longer see the plane on radar. But within 15 seconds, the plane was back on their scope. The controller said, Is United 863 still... Oh, there he is. He scared me. We lost radar. I didn't want to give you another airplane if we had a problem. End quote. The captain carefully put the plane into a climb, trying not to stall the plane out. The plane cleared the mountain by the smallest of margins. Some reports say that the jumbo jet missed the peak by about 100 feet. Once the jumbo jet was clear of the mountain, the captain took it up to 5,000 feet and the controllers gave the crew vectors to dump their fuel. The jumbo jet was fueled up for a 14 hour flight and so it was too heavy to land right away. Over the next 30 minutes, the pilots dumped about 187,000 pounds or 84 tons of fuel. After the plane had shed quite a bit of weight, the controllers cleared flight 863 for an ILS approach onto runway 28 right. After a while, the 747 made an overweight but safe landing on runway 28 right. I suspect that none of the 288 passengers even knew how close they came to disaster. The root cause for this near miss is really simple. Engine number three, the inboard engine on the right-hand side failed. This caused a thrust asymmetry that caused the 747 to turn to the left as it took off from San Francisco. 
This is because you have more thrust on the left-hand side rather than the right-hand side. But that simple explanation still leaves a lot of questions. Pilots are perfectly able to counter the yawing motion caused by thrust asymmetry by using the rudder. Why wasn't this crew able to do that? Well, as it turned out, that too had a very simple explanation. The first officer who was flying did not use the rudder. He used the ailerons. The rudder is the bit at the end of the vertical stabilizer. It deflects from side to side, and that helps pilots counter things like asymmetric thrust and a significant crosswind component. The ailerons, on the other hand, help the plane roll. So when the first officer used the ailerons to command a turn to the left to cancel out the effect of the failed engine, he was just rolling the plane to the left. It wasn't enough to stop the yaw to the right, and that meant that the 747 slowly started to drift away from the correct path towards the San Bruno mountain. Using the ailerons, also had another side effect that made it hard for the pilots to avoid the mountain. You see, when you use the ailerons to turn to the left, the spoilers on the left wing deploy just a bit. This increases drag on the left wing, and that helps the plane turn to the left. But in this case, less lift was the last thing that these pilots needed, as they were already on the edge of stalling. The spoilers on the left wing took away some of the precious little lift that they had. Now, it would be super easy to blame this on the pilot, and don't get me wrong, the pilot does share some blame for this. But understanding why the pilot did not use the rudder is key to preventing something like this from happening in the future. In the case of the first officer, he was just out of practice. This pilot had only made one takeoff and one landing in a real airplane in the past one year. This meant that when the pilot did pilot the plane out of San Francisco that day, he was doing it for the first time in about a year. That's not a knock on the pilot himself, but rather a consequence of the type of routes that he flew. For example, look at the San Francisco-Sydney leg that they were flying that night. That's an almost 15-hour flight, but for all those flight hours, you only get one takeoff and one landing. Moreover, since long-haul flights like these have a second relief crew. The few takeoffs and landings that you do get are split between a larger pool of pilots, meaning that each pilot gets fewer opportunities to practice their takeoff and landing skills. Now keep in mind these pilots had to perform a certain number of landings and takeoffs in a simulator to keep their skills sharp, but sometimes the simulator just isn't enough. In response to this, United reconstructed this flight in a simulator and showed it to its 9,500 pilots. They also increased the frequency of its refresher training for 747-400 crews from once a year to twice a year. But most importantly, in an effort to make sure that its pilots were not caught off guard, United mandated that pilots make at least three takeoffs and three landings in a 90-day period, with one of them being in an actual aircraft. While researching this video, I came across several articles that said that accidents like these are because younger pilots don't learn to fly light aircraft, such as tail draggers, at any point in their careers. Certain people say that flying such light aircraft can help pilots with their stick and rudder skills. They also say that flying such light aircraft is a more teachable experience as it is a more active form of piloting and can help pilots be less rudder shy. Do you think that is the case though? Do you think that learning to fly a light aircraft can help you fly a jumbo jet better? Let me know your thoughts in the comments below. Also, another thing that I left out before is the fact that San Bruno actually had radio towers on its peak, so the clearance between the tower and the plane might have been even less than 100 feet as reported. What is really surprising about this incident is that there isn't an official NTSB accident report about this. The main source of this article was a self-declaration by the first officer of Flight 863. Does anyone know why there wasn't a full-scale investigation of this near miss? I'd love to know if you know. Thank you for watching this episode of Mini Air Crash Investigation. If you want to watch another video, how about Africa Airlines Flight 771? Link on your screen and in the description. If you do like the videos that I make, 
do consider liking and subscribing. It will really help the channel grow. I will catch you guys next time. Stay safe.